Hi everyone, my name is Ines Liebscher and I'm a professor at the Institute of Biochemistry at the Leipzig University Medical Faculty. I have been working on adhesion type G protein coupled receptors for almost all of my scientific career and I am excited that uh, a lot of the things and uh, knowledge that we acquired in the past 10 years is now coming to a, such a nice and round story that uh, I want to present you today. And I really think that um, the information that we gathered already is already aiming at an angle to start thinking about therapeutic implications. And this is where I want to hopefully get you and follow me through the story. And uh, maybe in the end you'll agree this is going to be a very interesting target for future therapeutic interventions. So today we'll be talking about giants. We're not talking small, we're talking really big molecules. And uh, these big molecules can be somehow compared to what is sequoia trees, compared to other normal trees, because adhesion GPCRs are very large. They can become up to, or they can be up to 6,500 amino acids, while an average rhodopsin like GPCR is approximately uh, 400 amino acids. So you see, there's uh, quite a distinction in that. Adhesion GPCRs are very old, so in that they don't really differ much from, from other G protein coupled receptors. We have 33 members in the human genome, but we already know that there's more than 100 different slide variants. And that's easy to follow, thinking that the locus of an adhesion GPCR is so big, you can have multiple, um, like up to a 30, 40 axons that can be shuffled around. And interestingly, these slide variants are tissue specific and they can really differ in their function. So if we look at it, we're actually dealing with a lot more than those 33 acknowledged adhesion GPCRs. Like other cheaper and coupled receptors, also members of this uh, class govern essential physiological functions, which renders them highly interesting drug targets. Yes, the majority of them is still considered to be orphaned. Even though we've made quite a bit of progress, there's so far not a single small molecule or any other derived agonist available that can specifically be used to target an adhesion GPCR. When we look at them, we find very easily the explanation for the enormous size of these receptors. It all lies in the very complex internus. As you can see in the picture, this enterimus contains uh, these blue adhesive domains that are represented there. Above that barrel-like shape um, in gray, yellow, and orange, which is all part of a highly conserved GPCR autoproteolysis inducing domain. This gain domain is doing exactly uh, what the name says. It's inducing an autoprotelytic cleavage event as the receptor matures in the endosmatic reticulum. And uh, that means that the receptor is already shuffled as a functional heterodimer to the cell membrane. That cleavage event also marks the start of an encrypted tethered agonist that we refer to as the Stachel sequence. And that Stachel sequence is uh, also highly conserved amongst, among a lot of the GPCRs. As I already mentioned, we have these functional domains in the N-terminus, and they receive signals from the cellular environment. So it has been shown that extracellular matrix molecules, including collagens, laminins, or chondritin sulfates, can bind to the receptor, the same as cell surface molecules, among them CD55, integrins, or notch. The knowledge that we have gathered in the past years is that there is basically three different ways uh, of how adhesion GPCRs can be activated. The first one is a very classical one for G-coding coupled receptors. You can use small molecule agonists or even antagonists um, or peptides that are derived from the tethered agonist sequence. And they all bind into the putative, because it hasn't defined yet, binding pocket of an adhesion GPCR, which should be localized somewhere in the seven transmembrane domain that we know from uh, truncation mutants. 
On the other hand side, the interaction with the extracellular matrix molecules can also lead to receptor activation, not just binding. Even though that has not been shown sufficiently for adhesion GPCRs with known interaction partners, um, but we are getting more and more information that this might actually be happening here. And then the third option is we can apply mechanical forces. Adhesion GPCRs are also mechanical sensors. So the first part of my talk will focus on um, the activation that we have seen on adhesion GPCRs by staphylite peptides and small molecules. And I will guide you through this based on one exemplary receptor, and that is the adhesion GPCR GPO-126. That receptor has been our pet receptor. Basically, everything that, that my group does and that we learned is based on the findings of this specific adhesion GPCR. And you see here in the figure that it has the classic features of an adhesion GPCR. There's the AIM domain, a functional adhesive domain, you have a cup and a pendrixin domain, and apart from that, there's the seven transmembrane domain. That receptor uh, was, uh, became very interesting to us because it was published quite a few years back by Kelly Monk, who was at that point a postdoc in Talbot lab, and she had a project where she could show that mutation of GPO-126 induces a myelination deficit phenotype in zebrafish. So to explain to you, you see here in those pictures on the right, this is a myelin basic protein staining of a zebrafish larvae. And in the box below the, the bigger picture, you see an enlargement of the peripheral nervous system. And you see a nice stain for the water type, while on the picture below, you see the ST63 mutant, and there is a, quite a lack of myelination. The interesting part about this mutation is, is that it's not a complete knockout. It's a so-called hypomorph, because the mutation is located in the first extracellular loop, and it results in a decreased expression of the receptor. So there's still some receptor left that could, in theory, be activated, but it's not enough to help um, establishing a fully healthy myelination phenotype. So the next thing we did, or that Kelly did, is basically looking at mice. The phenotype is actually conserved among different species, so you can find the same um, thing in mice. So what you see in the upper picture is a normal psychiatric nerve in mice, while below is the knockout animal. And what you can see with the black arrows is that in the knockout animal, this psychiatric nerve is much paler and thinner. And these mice have a very terrible motor deficit as well. So knowing that there is uh, somehow a myelination deficit in these animals, and based on another aspect that was published by Kelly that you can rescue that phenotype in zebrafish applying forskelin, it was quite likely that GP126 actually induced cyclic gain P levels in the cell through GS coupling. And that is quite interesting because it has been known for many years that different levels of cyclic gain P govern the proliferation and the differentiation process of uh, swarm cells. So as long as the Schwann cell is differentiating, it needs low levels of cyclic AMP, while the switch from proliferation to differentiation is induced by a sudden burst of cyclic AMP. And so we cloned that receptor, overexpressed it in cost cells, and found that actually already basal activity is high enough to detect an increase of cyclic AMP level. And that level is uh, quite markedly reduced when you knock out GPO-126 with specific irony, well, you have a rebound of these levels when you just use control as irony situations. But then again, it's nice to know that there's some cyclic AMP signaling, and this was actually the first time that our, a real functional interaction um, in this G-protein-mediated pathway was shown for the receptor, but then again, what we really want is to be able to activate the receptor. And for that, um, we did some mutational, mutational uh, experiments and found that there is quite likely also a tested agonist sequence encrypted there. And to prove 
that and to be able to use that as a toolbox, we had a synthetic peptide library uh, design, which was based on the encrypted tested acid sequence in the receptor itself. And you can see the first amino acid is always a theremin. That is the first amino acid after the cleavage site. And then the tested agonist sequence is differing um, from all the way up to the transmembrane trans one, and then subsequently short. And these peptides were applied to a receptor truncation mutant that does not harbor the tested agonist sequence anymore. As you can see in the upper panel with no peptide, there's no activation, no basal activity here. And you can, you can recover that activity by applying the peptides. And the most efficient one we found was a peptide with a length of 16 amino acids. Uh, again, if you, if you shorten or elongate that P16 peptide, then you lose the activity. So here we have quite a good idea of what the, what the best peptidic agonist derived from the shuffle sequence could be. So as nice as it is, as it is to have something like that for in vitro settings, it's much more important if you can actually use it in an in vivo environment. So here we got into contact with Kelly, who had our own lab by then, and they tested that same hypomorph mutant that I already introduced to you with a peptide. In the upper panel, you can see that applying the MSO or the P16 peptide does not really change much in the myelination of wild type zebrafish. While when you do the same thing with the ST63 mutant, all of a sudden there's a marked increase in myelination. And uh, if you want to take a closer look in the paper, all of this has been quantified and uh, it's indeed significantly rescued. So that was the story to the tested agonist peptides. Again, these peptides do have a bit of a problem because they're highly hydrophobic, so um, they're hard to dissolve, and they're also not really specific for the receptor as the binding pocket is um, quite well conserved. So you have cross-activity between different adhesion GPCRs. So there was, of course, quite an interest to find small molecule compounds that could somehow modulate the receptor activity. And in this case, um, this study that I'm showing you here was initiated by Kelly's lab. They used their hypomorph zebrafish readout to test hundreds of compounds for a rescue of that phenotype. And among some of the compounds that did increase myelination was apomorphin. And they asked us if we can reproduce the finding that apomorphin likely activates GPA 126, uh, and that is the cause for resting that phenotype, we can show that in an overexpression specific system. And by doing that, incubating GPA 126 wild type cells with apomorphin shows a concentration uh, dependent increase of cyclic AMP levels, while you could not see this for empty vector transfected cells. On the other hand side, another opioid derivative, codeine, does not give us this type of specific activation. But then again, talking about specific is a little bit difficult here, as uh, apomorphin is obviously a dopaminergic agonist as well. So it's not an ideal candidate either, but out of that both the uh, study that we did, all of those other compounds that did rescue the phenotype, none really showed a receptor specific activation in our assay. So now we come to the next part. How can extracellular matrix molecules induce activation? So as I already said, they're not just interacting, they can actually lead to signal production in the cell. And often enough, when we talk about ECM molecule activation, we also have to talk about mechanical force activation because somehow that, mechanical, uh, that uh, ECM molecule needs to be introduced to act as a signal, and the force on the other hand side needs to be translated to the receptor. So it seems obvious that these two things should go hand in hand. So here, for example, GPA 126, the first ligand that had been published was uh, done in the tablet lab, and they could show that collagen 4 interacts 
the, the cup and pentaxin domain of TPO 126, and that this interaction leads to an increase in cyclic EMP level when cells are transfected um, with TPO 126. This is dependent on an existing entropy. In a parallel study, Shen Tiao, um, in a collaboration with Kelly, had identified lemon and 311 to be a binding partner of GPO 126, and they again asked us if we could do some pharmacology testing um, with this compound. And interestingly enough, we could show that uh, concentration dependent um, activities of g 26 was actually reduced. So it looked like it was an inhibitor of the receptor. So what you would expect from an inhibitor of g 126 in the myelination phenotype would be a worsening of the phenotype. So what they did, they overexpressed in Kelly's lab lemonin 211 in superfish larvae. What you see here is basically just a different way of looking at myelination in green, you find pseudocolored neurons that have been properly myelinated, uh, which you can see in the wild type is nicely happening. The wild type also overexpressing lemon 211 shows pretty much the same picture, while the same mutant, ST63, um, now shows the myelination deficit. So you can see there's uh, either two large or very small neurons being myelinated, and it's a lot less than in the wild type. And then when you overexpress lemonin 211, you get a residue of that phenotype. And that's quite puzzling, because that residue of that phenotype was dependent on cyclic EMP increase. While we could show that lemonin 211 decreases cyclic EMP levels. And to kind of try and make sense of these, this controversy, we have to go and take a look what is actually happening with these molecules. What, what do they do in, in vivo, right? Nature can often provide you with answers that you cannot come up yourself. And when you take a look back again at the textbook, you can see that before the swarm cell can start wrapping and myelinating, it needs to start forming a basal lamina around the neuron. And the first thing to be secreted is actually laminin-211. And it's secreted as a monomeric protein that then binds and sits on the neuron and later on starts polymerizing. And that polymerizing event leads to some of the like, basic structural uh, formation changes. And in the end, what results is a leaky basal membrane. And that leaky basal membrane is then tightened by collagen 4. Collagen 4 comes and sits then on the polymerized lemonin 211 molecules. So we were thinking, okay, so if you use collagen 4 in the in vitro setting, that pretty much fits the same thing as it does in nature. But with lemonin 211, something else is happening. And that something else might as well be somewhat of a force. Something needs to move, mimic this, because we couldn't induce the polymerization in our assay. So instead, we applied a mechanical force based on vibration. And here you see this is, again, the basic setup, anti-vector, and the wild type transfected GPO 126. We chose laminin concentration, which showed a slight decrease in cyclic EMP um, production on wild type GPO 126. And when we then added the vibration, you could see that g 126 on its own is already activated by the vibration, but when you then start combining laminin 211 with vibration, the change in activity is even higher. So again, that is nice to know, but I think we can all agree that a vibration is not really what's happening there when we're looking at uh, schwann mediated myelination. So we always wanted to know, and we were actually asked, what are the forces that are really acting on the receptor? What, what's going on there? And to investigate that, we set up an atomic force microscopy experiment. We see here in gray is the cantilever, and the cantilever can be um, conjugated with different molecules, and these molecules then interact with uh, the receptor being transfected into the cell. The cell is also co-transfected um, with 
a uh, cyclohene P biosensor, pink flamingo, um, that allows you to uh, detect cyclohene P production by an increase in uh, luminescence. So we applied that approach in the first part using collagen 4. We coated the candy lever with collagen 4, which should interact with the copper pendulous in the main of GB126. And the first thing is we push onto the cells. And pushing on anti vector transfected cells does not give you a result. Pushing on a cleavage deficient GP126 does not give you a result. But pushing on the wild type with one nanonewton force all of a sudden gives you a significant increase in cyclic production. So if you do more, it's not going to make it any better. Um, doing less gives you a little bit of psychic AMP, but not decisively. On the other hand side, when we start pulling on the receptors, we get nothing. So if you look at the in vitro setting, I already told you, we can imagine that when we apply collagen 4 onto cells being transfected with GP126, it's sitting on the receptor and gravity will pull it down. So in that way, collagen 4 will sit and push on the receptor. On the other hand side, we can also think that this makes sense when we remember that collagen 4 is also going to sit on top of that leaky basal membrane and that it could also push onto GP126. So on the other hand side, when we use lemon and 211 and we push, we get nothing. Just no, no idea, in, in no way, no cyclic gain key production. But when we start pulling, with increasing pulling force, we already start seeing some activation with 0 0.5 nanonewton, but we really get a significant increase in the second messenger production when we pull with 0 0.75 nanonewton. And that also makes sense when we think that looking just at laminin on its own sitting on the cell basically keeps cyclic AMP levels at low, keeping the receptor inactive. I guess if you just have enough, at some point you will decrease activity. While when we apply vibration to the cell being in a media, that media being vibrated will actually start moving. And that kind of moving can be translated into a shear force, meaning that the laminin bound to the receptor could be moved away and thereby starts pulling on the receptor. And that could be the signal that we see when we apply vibrational forces and that increases like the AP levels. And that also explains or makes sense in, in light of the physiological settings. So what we came up with in the end is that we believe that the N-terminus is an allosteric module that basically incorporates a lot of different signals that come from the outside. So we actually think that this is happening to more than just GP126. This could be more a generalized model for attention GPCRs, as we do know that several of them have different ligands. And each ligand then conveys a temporal spatial force specific intracellular signal, which means when we consider therapeutic targeting of the TCG PCRs, we should not just look at the seven transmembrane and the binding pockets, or maybe allosteric binding pods there. We should always think of the n itself. And if you consider that antibodies can be created to specifically target such a huge epitope, I think we have uh, a lot of ideas on how to proceed next. So with that, I want to conclude my presentation. I want to thank the people that really did the main chunks of this work. First of all, um, of course, the group uh, situated at the Leipzig University, at the Rudolf Schirmheimer Institute of Biochemistry, and there's Jakob, Jakob who did uh, all of these atomic force microscopy experiments under the supervision of Camilla Schinner and Volker Spindler in Basel. Um, we have Thorsten Schöneberg who has been supportive of a lot of these projects, helping with ideas, playing around with explanations for many years. 
And then there's um, Kai and Carol, who both are just um, indispensable for anything we do in this lab. And then, of course, as I mentioned several times, Kelly Monk has been a very close collaboration partner and a friend over all these years. And the same goes for Shen, who uh, is also now at the University of California in San Francisco. And of course, I want to thank all the third-party funding options that we uh, we had. It's really great that we can pr pursue all these experiments. And then finally, I want to thank you for your time and your interest. And uh, if you have further questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you.